Welcome to Disciple Disciplines, the podcast about Christian discipline. Soldiers in the Army of the Lord. Welcome to episode number 15 of Disciple Disciplines. My name is Glenn Ford, your host of these podcasts. Today I'm going to be doing a teaching on the fear of the Lord. Today we hear a lot about the grace of the Lord and thank God for His grace. But we hear almost nothing about the fear of the Lord. We need to understand the fear of the Lord because the fear of the Lord and the grace of the Lord are both of God. If we just are walking in the grace of God, but not having understanding of the fear of God, then we are walking lopsided, (laughs) right? We need to be in the middle of the road, not in the ditch on one side. We need to have the grace of God and the fear of God. Also in this episode, I have interviewed my wife. She had recently experienced a great fear of the Lord after a dream that my son had received, my 10-year-old boy had a dream, and not long after that, my wife had received a word from Scripture from the Lord, which really, really confronted her, and she had experienced the fear of the Lord. She's going to be talking about that in this episode. She's going to share that experience with us, and what she learned from it, and how it actually changed the family, particularly with my daughter. As my wife had repented, as the Lord had led, then we see the grace of God come into the household and actually heal the family. This is where the grace of God and the fear of God work together. It's not all about grace, 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 grace. We've got to have the fear of the Lord as well, which leads us to repentance and keeps us from sin. Then we'll see the grace of God work effectively in our lives. Okay, so this is what this is about. It's a great testimony. I I encourage you to hear it to the end. It's very, very powerful. And she will give advice to wives who have men in ministry. And it's really, really powerful. And I'm really glad that I was able to sit with her and ask her some questions about her experience. And her answers are quite profound. So go and grab your Bible. Go and grab a pen and grab something to write on. And let's get into God's Word today. Amen. Now, before I lead you to this interview, I want to share a scripture with you right here. This is out of Romans chapter 11. Now if you read chapters 9, 10 and 11 of Romans, we see that Paul is talking about Israel. They had heard the gospel, they had seen Christ in the flesh, and they had the word of God, the word of Moses and the prophets, and yet they would not accept him. They would not accept Jesus. And Paul talks about how God had hardened their heart so that the gospel could go to the Gentiles so that all could be saved, right? It's a wonderful plan of God. Paul is talking about this plan of redemption, and it's wonderful. But then we see in chapter 11, in verse 15, Paul says, For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what would their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, then the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Well, you will say then, if branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Israel was cut off or broken off so that we, the Gentiles, may be grafted in. Paul says, well said. Because of their unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Why fear? For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, 
Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Wow. We don't hear that preached too often, do we? <laughs> That's pretty radical, pretty bold. Paul is saying, you fear, fear God. Because he may not spare you either. Right? Now, this is one of many scriptures that Paul will talk about, this fear of the Lord. I also give other scriptures with the interview with Donna. So, without further ado, let's cross over now to the interview with my wife Donna, and she's going to share her experience she had just recently with the fear of the Lord. It was a very strong fear of God and how it changed her and the family. So, enjoy. Well, saints, today I've got with me a sister in Christ and also my wife, Donna. And she is going to be sharing with us an experience she had recently about the fear of the Lord. And it was quite profound. And I'm going to let her speak about that about her experience and what happened and what how it's changed her outlook on life now and her walk with the Lord now. So, welcome Donna. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today. Um, before we get into it, about your experience with the fear of the Lord, just to let the people know, you and I have been separated for quite a while, right? It's been 18 months, right? 18 months. 18 months. Um, and over that time, you said to me the other day that you noticed that you were not reading the Word as much anymore. No. You were sort of backsliding from the Lord. Is that right? Yep. And it wasn't long ago that our son Isaac had a dream. And I rang him and and he told me about his dream. And it was quite a a severe dream, a quite shocking dream. It actually shocked him and you. You were involved in the dream as well, correct? In this dream, you and him were killing these snakes. That's right. And there was lots of them, right? Yes. Now, obviously, a little boy, a 10-year-old boy, is going to be pretty concerned about that. So he rings up his dad, and he says, Dad, what's this dream mean? So I explained it the best I could to him and comforted him with it. But I knew there was something deeper to it. I knew there was a judgment. This was a warning. This dream was a warning, a very severe warning. And then I rang you, and I said, have you really prayed about this? Ask the Lord about it. And what was your response to that? My response was that I had prayed about it, but didn't get a clear answer to it. Okay. So then one day, it was a few days later, I guess, Yep. I was ringing up and just talked to the children, and I said, hey, can you put mum on, please? And I wanted to ask you again, have you sought the Lord about this? And as I'm saying that, the Lord gives me a word, right? Yep. And the word was, go and get your Bible. Open it up randomly, and God's going to talk to you and give you the answer. That's correct, yeah. Now, well, now, now, I had no idea what the Lord was going to say, but what was the word he gave to you? Repent. He gave, you, he gave me the scripture here to read. It was out of Zephaniah, right? That's correct. Zephaniah chapter 2, out of the New Living Translation, your Bible is. Yes. And you said to me that what caught your attention was the heading. And what was the heading? A call to repentance. A call to repentance. Wow. And I'm just going to read that, if that's okay. Those few verses the Lord gave you. Yep. Zephaniah chapter 2. Take note of this, saints. Okay, I want you to read this. Zephaniah chapter 2. A call to repentance. This is out of the New Living Translation. Gather together. Yes, gather together, you shameless nation. Gather before judgment begins. Before time to repent is blown away like chaff. Act now before the fierce fury of the Lord falls and the terrible day of the Lord's anger begins. Seek the Lord, all who are humble, and follow his commands. Seek to do what is right and to live humbly. Perhaps even yet the Lord will protect you, protect you from the, his anger on the day of destruction. Wow. <laughs> wow. All I can say is, wow. Yeah. That would certainly shake me up if the Lord gave me that word. So what was your response to that word? Wow. <laughs> um, it was I, it was shell-shocking. It, it just was like, oh, my gosh, wow. I was having trouble even reading the word because of my guilt and shame for leaving the marriage and um, loved the Lord and had him in my heart totally. and worshipped him and loved him but it's been a hard 18 months and then to get that word was like it it took my breath away to the point where I had difficulty breathing wow 
there was that conviction of sin, I guess, right? It was always there, but that just really, well, Jesus just told me. He just showed it to me right there in front of my eyes. I suppose it was time that I was ready to see it because it was always there. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. That is a phenomenal scripture to get, and that is a great testimony. This is why I had you on the podcast today, because to get a word like that from the Holy Spirit to a born-again person who's in the New Covenant, God is talking about this call to repentance lest judgment comes. Right? Now, this is one thing we don't hear in the church, unfortunately. We have a lot of saints out there today who are under this grace teaching. It's all about grace, 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 grace. And look, I thank God for the grace. Thank God for his grace. Otherwise, none of us would be here. Right? None of us can be saved mm-hmm. without his grace. But we also got to understand that God is holy and we must have a holy fear of God because the grace of God and the fear of God are both of God. Is that right? So if we walk in just in the grace of God, then we walk on lopsided. We're on the wrong, we're on the ditch on the wrong, on the other side of the road. We need to be in the middle of the road and understand the grace and the fear so we can live a holy life where God can speak to us and we can get convicted of our situation and repent. It's interesting. I'm going to read to something out of Hebrews chapter 10. Listen to me, saints. This is really important. That Donna's testimony here of what God brought her to her face, really, in this absolute fear. And you were telling me you couldn't even work that day, right? I had to have the next day off work. I couldn't work. I was literally felt like I was having a heart attack in the natural, but it was spiritual. Right. That's the fear of the Lord. Yeah. This massive fear just come over me, like, and it just wouldn't go away. And spent time in prayer and repented of the little things that he was showing to me that's not important to get into, but I just knew it was deeper and it just wasn't coming out and the breathing got heavier and the pain in my chest got heavier. And then all of a sudden I hear a knock on the door and it was one of my beautiful sisters in Christ that come over and she's like, what is wrong with you? And, um, and I had told her what happened, and she's like, we've got to pray, sister, we've got to pray. And we got down and we prayed together, and it was through that that the Lord took me so much deeper and deeper and deeper. And it was the most horrifying time of my life in fear and trembling, but also the absolute best time of the peace of God all at the same time. And I'm glad you had that. And more of us need to have that revelation because people are dabbling with sin and it's been tolerated. And we've got to realize this. I mean, God will not tolerate this stuff. He will not. There is judgment begins with the house of God. And unfortunately, it's only very few people and it's a remnant. I often talk about in this podcast, this remnant that God is raising up to live a holy life, to have the understanding of the fear of God and the grace of God. You know, people talk about the grace of God, but I'm telling you something. If you don't understand the fear of God, then you don't understand the grace of God. Because the grace of God empowers us, equips us to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Yeah? Yeah. Because we have a holy reverence and a fear of the Lord. We know that there is a judgment to come. And look what Hebrew says in chapter 10 of Hebrew. Now, Hebrew starts talking about the wonderful blessing of the, the new covenant. And it's wonderful how Jesus shed his blood once and for all. But then it says in verse 26 of chapter 10, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Now, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much more worse punishment, do you suppose, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, 
the Lord will judge his people. There it is. The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. Mm. Amen. Yes, absolutely it is. And you've experienced that, right? Yeah. That It is a fearful thing. It really it is. It, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We are commanded to live a holy, righteous life for our sake. So if I can just ask you briefly, you were saying uh, one of the major things the Lord asked you to repent of was idolatry. Yep. Now that's interesting, you know, because we can think that Christians aren't really living in idolatry because they love God and they love Jesus. But yet there are many who are today Christian people who love Jesus, but living in idolatry. We may not have a big temple in our house and bowing down to a statue, but idolatry is deeper than that, right? Correct. Yeah. Well, so what did the Lord show you about idolatry? He showed me that I had my husband. I was worshipping my husband, not Jesus. I really didn't have a relationship with Jesus that I put my husband there and needed my husband to meet my needs and what I needed. And, you know, if I had a problem or needed to pray, I'd go to my husband and go to him, to the Lord. He just showed me that the relationship was through me, through Glenn, through Jesus, where he was really calling me to have that relationship from me to God. And it was in the last 18 months when Glenn hasn't been there, it had been my pastor or a friend. He was just really showing me that line that I was veering off instead of going straight to him. You know, it's interesting you say that because, you know, in relationships, whether it be marriages or with parents and children, you know, we can lead the example and lead through the scriptures like, no, you shouldn't be doing that. That's idolatry. That's wrong. And you said something the other day about this, you know, that we can hear it and hear it and hear it and hear it and hear it, but never do it until, until God really starts to wake us up. People need to get a revelation of it. Right? I think um, it's that. We've got it as head knowledge because we know it. I knew it. I knew what I was doing, but it was like a head knowledge, but not deep into my heart where I was fully obediently doing it, but it was there as head knowledge yep. until the Lord showed me this. Yep. So idolatry, that's interesting. I mean, the idolatry, it, it, it is rampant today among the saints because people idolize their children. They idolize their spouse, even themselves. They can make themselves an idol because they're trying to do things their way on their own understanding rather than trusting God for everything. That's right. And that's what the Lord really showed me, that the issues in our marriage, and he showed me my heart, and it was full of corruption and, and resentment and anger and unforgiveness, and he showed me this heart and that I was trying to be God in my marriage to fix my heart. But he showed me that, yeah, those issues are real and they're there, but how dare you press the buttons and there was a button in the middle of my heart and how dare I press those buttons to try to fix my husband and our problems because they, they they weren't mine to fix. And that's where the adultery jumps into it as well. I was idolizing myself and my husband because I had to fix these problems. But he showed me that they weren't mine to fix, that they were his to fix. You know, it's interesting. We see this a lot in relationships, you know, where the spouse tries to change the other person. And that's what I was doing. You know? And the only time we see it change is when we let it go. When we let go, then let God, then God can minister by his Holy Spirit the best way he knows how to. Yeah. And he can reach all of us at the perfect time in the perfect way. And I've said this one time before. I remember <laughs> I remember I was saying something some years ago. And um, I said to someone, you know, I've been telling it for like 10 years. But what God did it in like, you know, like that. What I couldn't do in 10 years, God did in a moment. You know? 
Yeah. And we got we got to get that. We really got to get that. That relationship in marriage is not about trying to fix the other person. Amen. You know what I mean? Our, ultimately, is our relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what he showed me. You know? Because, like Paul said, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account, right? To receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, Paul said, right? That's what we're going to be living for. That's it. As I talked about this in previous ep- episodes on marriage and the covenant and the role of, of the spouse, of a husband and a wife, it does not change our relationship with Jesus Christ and our responsibility to him in obedience to him. And I thank God that he does chasten us. Yeah. It's not always nice, but yeah, I thank God too for that. Absolutely, because (laughs) the Bible says that God chastens those whom he loves. Yeah. Right? And that proves that he does love us. Like any good parent would discipline or chasten his children if they know they're going off in the wrong direction. Because they love them, they will chasten them, they bring them back for their own good. If they just let them go, then they're going to fall into danger, right? Mm. It's a dark world out there, no doubt about it. The world is very corrupted, very polluted, and very evil. Where Satan is the lord of it. Right? So if we start wandering off out there, because he loves us, a loving father, he will chasten us and bring us back to where we need to be. Sometimes, sometimes you've got to give it a smack across the ear sometimes. Yeah. The Lord has brought me to my face many times as well. And I thank God for it. But because of that, it's now matured me. I'm now a better man than I was before. Yeah a better disciple than I was before because I've been through the hardship, been through the fire, you know, and be- and allowed him to chasten me. I went to the Lord one time. I said, Lord, don't treat me like a baby. Don't treat me like a baby. I want you to be stern with me. And he has. Like, he's letting me cross my face. If I'm wrong, you tell me so. And he has. And, and I'm glad because we don't want to be babies, right? So what's this done for you now? You've been through this experience. You've had this fear of the Lord. What would you say to someone else who's listening to this episode right now? What would you say to them who's someone who believes, who's stuck in this grace teaching, for example? What advice would you give to them? Seek God. (laughs) Um, Get with God. Just get with God and seek him because there is grace, but there has to be a balance of both. And for 18 months, I've had pastors and I've had friends but da 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 but da 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 but but the word says this you know go with the word go with what god's telling you and what the word is telling you and if you're convicted by it and you can't read certain parts of it it's because god is convicting you in that area and you need to seek god in that area after this time of prayer this went on for 3 days And it's only a short broadcast, so you can't go into it all. But at the end of it, I had a clean heart. A pumping, clean, beautiful heart. Not the heart that I saw at the start, but it was clean and pure. That was the big word that he gave me. It was clean and pure before Jesus. And what it's done for me is to, no matter what, I need to sacrifice or lose, the most important thing in my life is to keep this pure, clean heart before Jesus Christ. Amen. And I'm glad you said that. That is so true. You know, and you talked about sacrifice. And a lot of us talk about, oh, I'm, I'm making this sacrifice for you, Lord, or for you, husband or wife or whatever. I had a good friend of mine visit me recently. He said, you know what? Obedience is better than sacrifice. And that is so true. That's scriptural. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Right? And, you know, we learn through suffering a lot of time. The Bible says about Jesus, how he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He suffered in the flesh so he could learn to be obedient to the Father. Right? And we are to live like that too. He is our example. If we are disciples of Christ, then we are to mimic Christ. Correct. We are called to suffer with him. And we need to be chastened sometimes. We need to be brought to our knees sometimes. You know? Because if we just dabble around in 
you know, having parties and going to the church and just celebrating and praising and singing and have a lunch. Which, that's what I was doing, yeah. It, it is, it's, that's no different than just, you know, socialism. Well, there was no growth. There was no peace. There was no peace no. in it, no. And then when we just read Hebrews, you know, the, the scripture before that says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And then he goes on and says, but if we sin willfully, there's no more, there's no more um, sacrifice for sin, right? And there's a judgment to come. But that's what we come together for. People will often use that one verse, oh, but don't forsake the sin when they're together. Like, let's go to the church and just celebrate and praise and, you know, and say hello and love each other. That's not what we come together for. If we read the context, he's saying we come together so we can exhort each other, encourage each other to walk and live a holy, obedient life. That's why we come together. And I'm so glad that the Lord brought my brother over from overseas to come and visit me just recently. And he got with me and we got together and we just exhorted each other. We spoke about the word. We spoke about Jesus. We talked about the miracles he was doing. As we did and we just got with each other and he spoke to me very boldly sometimes. We exhorted each other so we can live in a holy, obedient life. And after he left, I was blessed. That's what we come to go. That's what we come together for. Not to come together just to sing songs and have lunch. That's not what we come together for, right? So it's interesting how people can use one verse and blow it out of context completely. In context, he's talking about we come together so we can encourage each other to live an obedient, holy life. Because if we go and sin willfully, then there is a fearful judgment to come, right? We've got to get this. We've got to have a fear of the Lord. So in your opinion then, why do you think many of the body of Christ are not living in true obedience to what the scriptures talk about? For example, marriage and divorce and remarriage is a big one. They're huge. Do you think it is now because you've, you've experienced the fear of the Lord? Do you think it is because people who are doing those things have not really had a fear of the Lord? Correct, yes. So the fear of the Lord, we need it to keep us from sin. Yes. Correct? And if we do stumble in the sin, we repent. Yeah? But if we don't have that fear of the Lord, then we walk on out of balance and we're going to sin. And then we're going to try and justify it because oh, we think the grace of God covers that. Yeah. Yeah? But he said if we sin willfully, if we know what's wrong and do it anyway, then the grace of God does not cover that. There is a judgment to come. It is, isn't it's it? huge. So I'm, I'm so glad you got that. I am so glad you got that for your sake. It was like this massive something just lifting off me oh, yeah. that I can now get into the Word and worship God without that guilt, that heaviness, that guilt oh, of, yeah. that I've, I'm cleansed and I'm pure before Him. You got cleansed and pure because you went through that repentance, right? Yeah. A lot of people think, well, I'm clean, I'm, I'm clean, I'm, I'm sin free all the time. But that is hypocrisy. That no. is, that is not truth at all in that. That I'm doesn't lie with the repentance. Yeah. Absolutely. Paul talks about through his letters. Peter talks about through his letters. We just read it in Hebrews. These are all letters written to the born again people. Us. Yeah. So there's no such thing. I am um, the greatest covers me for eternity now. I'm right now. I'm home, home and hosed. I can go and remarry many times. That's cool. No, <laughs> you're going to face the judgment of God unless you repent. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm so glad you got that. And you also said to me that since this has happened, there's been a change with our children. With my daughter. She actually was there seeing me going through what I was going through and was actually quite concerned about me. I, As I said, I couldn't even work. It was a really horrific three days and um Glenn's come up this weekend and spent a lot of time with the family and I and we've spent some time together as a family and I've noticed just a massive softening change um compassion to my daughter to my husband now so and yet she didn't go through it but me being the mother and the you know, her spiritual person in her life for this time, for this season, this 18 months, we've been separated, that I was able to to get rid of that sin, sin in my life that 
that my daughter hadn't gone through that or done that or repented, but I've seen the flow of grace Absolutely. onto her life as she's only, you know, 15. Um, my parents are up from Melbourne at this time and she just loves spending time with my parents and that she only sees them for two weeks of a year. And it says, oh, I'm going over to see Daddy. Do you want to come? And normally it had been like, no, I'm staying with my grandparents. And she's like, no, I want to come see Daddy. I want to come see Daddy. You know, it's interesting. You know, the amazing change that the, the children see immediately. This is why, you know, the responsibility of the parents is to live a holy life. Because if, if we're living in rebellion and sin, then the children will live in rebellion and sin as well. Yes, I see that from you, my you know what eyes. Mean? And you saw that with our daughter, yeah, with uh, Hannah. Yeah. You were living a rebellious life and she was following the same suit. Yes. Right? When God brought you to your knees and that humbled you in that, you repented. All of a sudden now she is turned. Now all of a sudden she has his love and compassion. She's no longer more she's no longer rebelling anymore. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. So we see the fruit of it now. The fruit comes we one person repents and we see the fruit from that flows into the family. It is remarkable. That was really mind blowing to see that because I really thought Hannah would have to go through the process and she may later on, I don't know. She was just mimicking her mother, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> she saw true. her mother repent and now she's got this new heart. Yeah. But now but it changes the environment as well. See, she wants that now. She wants she wants that that pure heart. She wants to be without the unforgiveness of in it. You know, she sees a new mummy at the moment. I she mean, sees that mummy is all of a sudden happy and wanting to be with daddy again. And it's what little girls want, isn't it? Praise all children want to be with their family. Praise and, the Lord. You know, I'm just yeah. reminded of a testimony of a sister that we both know who came to us some years ago. She was a Christian. She was born again. But she was not bearing any fruit in her life and she was frustrated. And she came and she wanted to get a life changed. So we've done some ministry with her. And we, we sat down and yep. let her through some repentance. And the Lord took her way back to it when she was a childhood. Yep. And started to confess all this sin. It was a good session. She got set free from all this. Then we baptized her. Yep. She got free. And she was on fire for God. On the and, yeah. She was on fire <laughs> for the Lord. Now, yeah. she had been walking with the Lord for like 30 years before that. Yeah? 25 years, 30 years. Yeah. But now she's on fire for the Lord. She was doing nothing before. Now she has this time of repentance and a true baptism. She gets kickstarted on the street and she's just on fire. She sent me this big text about what happened in McDonald's. She's in McDonald's yes. and she was praying for someone and there's demons. <laughs> Casting <manif> demons. <laughs> yeah. Casting demons out in McDonald's. It was yeah. awesome. Yeah. And yeah. the big change with her children. And that's what I'm saying. This is the testimony that with her young daughter, she's got two uh, twins, twins, right? She's got twins. So twin. And she, she was saying that she was really struggling with them because she was homeschooling them. Yeah. yeah. And and she noticed that her daughter came to her after she had been set free. Yeah. And said, Mummy, I want that. <laughs> there's something different about you. I want what you've got. What is it? And she said, I got baptized. I'll get free. Oh, I got goosebumps. <laughs> remember this remember that? It was a yeah, powerful She got baptized a few weeks later. She I got think, baptized she? and then yeah. her, mother, her daughter saying, I want that. Because Mum, you're not getting angry anymore. Mm. All, all this frustration seems to be gone. You're changed, yeah. and I want what you have. Yeah. And how old is the daughter? I think about 10 at the time, 11. 10, 11 year old. Yeah. The children see it, yes, and they desire it. They see it in their parents, and they want what they have. Yeah. yeah. And remember, she had this big boil on the leg, on the thigh, and she kept on praying for her. Mum was praying for her, and there was nothing happening. But she asked me, oh, she wants to get baptized. I said, then baptize her. She was, she, but she was concerned that she might be a bit too young. Remember? But she so wanted it, didn't she? She did. Well, yeah. so look, she's, she's, she can see the change in you. She believes in Christ. She, she's repented. Baptize her. And when she did, that thing pff, it burst open and she was healed instantly, yeah. right? <laughs> what a change. And the children, the children, it, it passed not only from her, but down through her children as well. Yeah, and we've just experienced the same thing. So you see what I'm saying? With our daughter, the same thing. Yeah. You repented. You got a clean heart. Yeah. Now you've got the presence of God in your house again. Yeah. And Hannah, our daughter, saw it and said, Mom, I want that. And But she changed instantly. Yeah, she didn't say it, but she just, the actions changed. Yeah, she just yeah. changed. Yeah. Because that's that's the grace of God. Yeah. That's grace. He's good. He's grace, for us. But see, the, the grace works with the fear of God. 
It's not independent of each other. We both, we could have both because they both are of God. They both are God. Yeah. When we repent, because God gives us a fear of God, then His grace moves in and He, then, he saves our children and all kinds of wonderful things. That's the grace, not the that's grace. That's grace. Like the, that's the grace. Amen. That's the grace. And the, that grace works coincided with the fear of God. Yeah. When we obey. Yeah. When he, we get on our knees and we repent, then His grace is sufficient and it saves us and our children. It is wonderful. That's yeah. the grace of God. Amen. Yeah. It is so cool. Okay, so why is it then that God has revealed this to you and given you this great fear of the Lord and, and turned to repentance? Why is it that God has not done that with other born again believers? They love the Lord, they're born again, and yet but they have been married three, four times, for example, and yet have no conviction of it at all, or other other kinds of sins, and there's no conviction of it at all. What what was the difference in your case, you think? I think for me is that I had friends coming up to me, sisters in Christ actually, saying to me, oh, you've been separated for one year now. Why aren't you going to get divorced? And another really close friend, big part of the church, even took me to Woman's Refuge and get this out on Glenn and get that out on Glenn. And um, so I had this huge influence of people that I loved and cared for and considered as sisters in Christ, as friends telling me to do all this. But the whole time I stood strong through this 18 months. I am not getting a divorce. God's word tells me you don't get divorced, that marriage is a covenant and you don't go and do that and you don't go and do that. And the question is why? Why I didn't? I believe because my husband never stopped praying for me and never stopped interceding for me that I would come to the point where the Lord's done what he's done in my life. I mean, I think that that is the key because what Paul says, you know, that pray always, right? Pray without ceasing. He encourages to pray for one another, praying in the spirit that we're making intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And that is true. I mean, it's that interceding and it's that praying and seeking God, please move on their behalf. Do your will, Lord, and believing it too. Yeah. Believing that. And unfortunately, we're living in a society today where people are just very lazy. It's very, very lazy. They're not praying for each other. You know, one of the hardest things to get with all churches I've really experienced is, out of all churches, the hardest thing they have to get people together is prayer meetings. Yeah. They can be 300 people in the, in, the, in the congregation. They call a prayer meeting, like a weekly prayer meeting. They get like three or four people come. That's Amen. it. Yeah. But that's always, it's always been that way, you know, because people just don't want to pray. They want yeah. to go, rather go and watch football or something. That's it. Yeah. So that's the key. That yeah. was great. That, that's the key. The yeah. interceding, the interceding and believing that. And, and see changes and miracles in their lives. Yeah. And you said also about the word. The word says this. It doesn't change. It's there. And, that, and that's what it was, the big thing for me. I just could not get past. The word says it. But the word says this. Amen. What a wife is meant to do. What Amen. a wife is meant to be. What marriage is. And through this 18 months of separation, I could not get past what people were telling me, the influences from godly people. And then what the word had said, what the word was, what the word said, what the word is. And I just could not get past that. And it's interesting, isn't it, how you see this a lot, unfortunately, how what people say, they may be caring and loving and have good motive. But what people often will say would often oppose what the word says. And it, it was. I had one sister say to me, beautiful sister, I love her and I love her until today. But I had one sister say to me, but I can't, get, I was saying to her, I can't get past this bit in the Bible. This is, this is what the Bible's saying that a wife needs to be and needs to do. And she says to me, oh, you can't believe everything the Bible tells us. It was written 2,000 years ago, and we need to test the Bible. And now the Lord has now taken this sister away from my life, and I love her dearly. But. That's the sort of stuff that I was coming up against. Yeah. Yeah. And you won't have a whole lot of friends when you want to obey God. 
Correct. That's for sure. You won't. You'll lose friends. I think that's why the Lord emphasizes so much about the marriage covenant is because when you're living a life for Jesus Christ and it gets hard and it gets lonely and people are telling you this and people are telling you that, that you need to stand strong in him and you've got a strong marriage as well. You just, you know, you're there for one another and you just become each other's best friends because it can get lonely going through that. So we see that the marriage relationship is identical to what Paul talks about. To the saints, we are to encourage each other, build each other up. Whether we're married or not, just brothers and sisters, the same yes. deal. Because the world will oppose the things of God. Even many who love the Lord will oppose the Word of God. Yeah, I've experienced And then trying to justify it. Yeah. Because it's all under the grace, right? Yeah, and, and that, that was that's... really hard, Glenn. That was really hard. Um, standing as strong as I did and not doing what my brothers and sisters in Christ were telling me to do. That yeah. that was very hard. Yeah. And I understand exactly. I've been through that myself some years ago. You know, you, you know what the Word says. You know what your heart's desire is, what God's prompting you to do. And you go and seek some advice, for, some help from some eldership, for example, being walking with the Lord a lot longer, thinking that they, well, maybe they can help me but they actually opposing what your heart says to do. And that's where I went so wrong, because many times I did the same to you. And, you know, many times that we will go and listen to them, because, well, they're elders, and they've got more experience than me, and they hear God better than me, and yeah. we yield to that. Yeah. But as a result, we're actually disobeying God. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not fulfilling His call at all, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, obviously, we, we need to be interceding for each other. We need to be praying for each other. Very important, extremely important. You know, we must pray for one another because it does get tough. Yeah. And we're not going to be, you know, have a whole lot of people agree with us or a whole lot of support. Our support and our comfort come from the Holy Spirit. Yeah? Yeah. That's our comfort and our support. The Holy Ghost. We need to maintain our close relationship with Him, even in marriage. Yes, correct. That's that's where we got into danger. Where people fall in marriage is that they, they're trying to get their comfort and support from their spouse. When I needed to get it from Jesus. It only comes from the Holy Ghost, yeah? yeah? He is our comforter, not our husband or our wife. And through doing that, the Lord showed me that you get what you need through people and husband anyway when you're being obedient We're and obedient. getting what you need from him. And that's what he showed me with the... With the vessels hanging from the heart, you know, that as I reach to him, not to Glenn, not to my friends, not to my children, but as I reach to him, and then he does it. He freed me from that burden. Amen. He does it. As I seek him, as I turn to him, as I trust him and love him, then the buttons I was trying to push to get what I needed from my husband, he'll do that. And that, that's what he showed and me. And we just we talked about that with, me. with our daughter. I mean, he did that, right? He changed the family. He changed the household. In, in a minute. In, and we've been striving and arguing and whatever for 18 months. And it's like this one night, my husband rings to talk to my son about a dream. And he's like, can I talk to mum? And the word. And then it was just had me on my knees to the point where I couldn't even work for three days. And it's just, it's done three days in 18 months. Amen. If I was <laughs> obedient and open to hearing him, I would have saved myself and my months. family Amen. 18 months of utter, utter, utter hardship. But you know what? In saying that, I thank God for it because we wouldn't be where we are without it and we Amen. wouldn't we will not continue to do the calling without it because it's matured us both it's strengthened us both and we just got it now you know he's the key and you got to go through those trials for god to use you in a, a dramatic way we needed this 18 months for him to prepare us to get us to where we're going Amen. Because it's going to be hard and it's going to continue to get harder. But because we've been through the hardship, we are now got the keys in what works and what we need to do in the hard times. And it is cry out. Yeah, that puts a new light on the scripture that says rejoice in times of trial. 
It's Does right. It? You don't feel like rejoicing during it, but now my heart, my soul, my every being is just, I'm excited. I'm excited to see where it's going to go from here because I held him back. I'm just, I'm excited to see of what God's going to go do through this. And I think that that's a great lesson that you just said, you know, that God can use us and he is calling for us to do particular things. Every member of the body of Christ has a function and we need to know what that is so we can fulfill it. But a lot of times in relationships, there can be a hindrance because the spouse hasn't got that revelation or doesn't want to do it. That's good. And they actually hinder the spouse from doing it and ultimately disobeying God. You and I have both seen this in many relationships that we know. Yeah. You know, my advice to people in ministry is that, you know, I hear you wives' hearts because it does get tough when you've got a husband with a calling, but just continue with Jesus. And I think we go terribly wrong when we try to be the ruler. And I did that in my marriage too. I tried to, no, you can't go overseas because what's going to happen with the children? And how about money? See, this is who I was. I was the warrior. I was like, you just can't not work and go serve God because we've got to pay the rent. We've got to pay the school fees. We've got to have food. But no, Jesus does that. Amen. And it does get tough when you're sure. living in it. Sure. And I just encourage you women that have got men in ministry that just keep close to Jesus and love them. And don't push the buttons you don't need to push. Just push Jesus' button. Amen. Yeah. That's good. And closing with that, that is great. So, hey, thank you, Donna, yeah. for being with me today on this episode. Saints, that was a powerful one. Would, would you agree? That word that Donna got from the Lord shook her up, changed her life, and I pray that it shakes you up too. To repent of your carnality, repent of your timidity, repent of your lukewarmness, and get serious with God. Okay? Because this is the last day, saints. God's coming back real soon, and we need to take this seriously. Would you agree, Don? I agree. you have any, any last words before we close up today? Seek God. <laughs> Seek God. Amen. Yeah. Seek, Seek God, God and, and in everything you do. Amen. And keep that pure heart before him. Excellent. That you may hear him Excellent. guide you. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent words. Okay. Thanks again, Don. Thanks for you for being with me today. Love you. God bless. So, saints, there it is. What do you think? It was pretty powerful, wasn't it? And what she went through, that experience with God, it was really a terrifying fear of God. You know, saints, the fear of God is very real and we must understand it and walk in it to live a holy life. And she really experienced that as you heard her testimony. You know, saints, we need to have a fear of the Lord because it's healthy, because it keeps us from sin. Yeah? And it keeps us living a holy life that's pleasing to the Father, pleasing to Jesus. We do not want to be grieving the Holy Spirit. Okay? Because we are all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Like Paul said, like I shared with Donna in the interview. That is the truth. We must fear the Lord. And we heard from the interview that how the grace of God works in coherence with the fear of the God. Right? It's not about just grace, 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 grace. Too many people living in sin thinking that it's all under the grace. That is foolishness. You will face the judgment of God if you do not repent. Okay, saints? So I hope you got something out of that. Share it with your friends. Share it with your family. Share it with your brothers and sisters. This needs to be heard. Okay? This is real. We cannot continue in sin. If we continue in sin, then God will either humble us and bring us to our knees and repent, or we may die before it's time, okay? We must fear the Lord, and we must be interceding for the saints, as you heard in their testimony. We must be interceding for one another, okay? And don't be fellowshipping with people who are compromising, who are living in sin, because if you're doing so, then you are a partaker of that sin. John says that in his letter, okay? So there it is, saints. Until next time, remember to love God. By loving God means you fear God also. 
okay? Means you obey God because you love God and you fear God. So love God, obey God, and love one another, serve one another, pray for each other, intercede for one another. Okay, saints, until next time, God bless you. Amen. Thank you.